Good afternoon, world. This is Joe Bergamini coming to you live on the Sabian Facebook page and the Sabian YouTube channel for the Sabian Education Network for our weekly Friday roundtable. Highlight of my week, highlight of the week of so many of our members. This has been such a great couple of months of running shows. Uh, and so welcome. Come on in. Post your friendly comments. Only friendly comments, only positive comments, only good questions. This is this is a room of love. The Sabian Education Network room is we're here to support each other, have a good time, uh, share information. And one of the great things, of course, I always have my teacher, mentor, and my partner in crime, Mr. Dom Famularo. Hi, Dom. Hi, Dom. And one of the great things is uh, we've had some tremendous educators as guests, but also we have uh, a case to have some people who are great friends, and sometimes we have both, such as today. So I'm really pleased to welcome two wonderful guests. Um, let's start uh, next to me on the top right, uh, Sherry Maracle. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Joe. Hi, Dom. Um, great to see everybody. So a little brief intro, Sherry. Um, she's currently from Saving Education Network. We're teachers. So Sherry is teaching at University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She's founder and leader of the Devo Orchestra. She's played all over the world. Most of the pre most prestigious venues in the world from Lincoln Center on up <clears throat> has had grants from the Kennedy Center and the State Department to play all around the world representing our country. Wow. Um, actually has experience as the owner of a venue where we hosted the mm -hmm. Saving Education Network event in Philadelphia. Um, Oh my gosh, I don't even remember. You turned 50 and you don't remember how long ago anything was. I don't remember when that was, but it was great whenever it was. Was it a year ago? I, I feel like everything was a year ago. Yo, it's all downhill from here, so don't worry about it. Just take it in. Right. Um, and of course, Sherry's, uh, in addition to her uh, playing credentials and plays with the New York Pops and uh, is a wonderful teacher and teaches privately as well. And then... Also, uh, an old friend of our, an old friend of mine. We kind of grew up together, and uh, both studying with Dom, met up uh, here in the New Jersey scene. Mr. Neil Garthley. Hey, Neil. Hey, Neil. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for having me. Uh, it's hard to follow that resume that she has. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to be <laughs> talking about. That was like impressive. I was like, okay, I'm going to go now. <laughs> so Neil, Neil actually has one of the most uh, successful private. Um, drum instruction businesses in the country. Uh, it's called the Academy of Drums and Guitar. I, I'm not sure about the guitar thing. I, I we, we allowed him on anyway, even though he had guitar in the name. But yeah, we're, <laughs> the, jury, the jury's out on it. Uh, scoot under the radar. <laughs> uh, the Academy of Drums and Guitar has been teaching um, for many, many years with a very full, um, uh, you know, plate of students and is a uh, very one of the most fine-tuned business owners that I know. He's also performed at a lot of the major drum events in the world. He was at COSA, Cape Breton Drum Festival, and traveled to Milwaukee doing clinics all over. Has a wonderful curriculum that he's designed for all of his students. Um, one of the very few people that I know that had a very cool cable access TV show that reached hundreds of thousands of viewers over the years. Um, I was called Drumology TV. I was a guest on it, and you'll develop a lot of content with that. Um, and, it was, uh, he, and he's going to talk a little bit about what's he gonna, what he's going to do with that content going forward and has toured and performed with his band Juggling Sons uh, all over the Northeast U.S. So welcome, Neil. Welcome, Sherry. So glad. Thank, to thank you. Here. Thank you. Hey, I Sorry, Neil, I just have to laugh because the, your, the sign behind your head on my uh -huh. screen it says rums and tar. And tar? <laughs> rums and tar? Yeah, rum, rum and tar. I'm like, all right. Arr, <laughs> I think it's some rum time. <laughs> Put just, the tar just, on them. Just move over so you block out the word guitar and leave only. Uh, <laughs> uh, did you do yeah. this? Rums? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Drums. There we go. Drums. Felipe Drago I'll, has commented this. I'll stand right there. Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Felipe Drago, our. Uh, who was our guest and he's in London says, he commented, there's very few people who haven't studied with Tom. So that's actually, <laughs> it's, been, it's been actually really great seeing the, uh, the long shadow Dom that you've cast with, you know, not only those of us who have studied with you, but everybody, everyone that we've in, invited and, and just, just inviting to the July guests that we have coming up. Um, everyone's like, Oh, Dom and I go way back. Fred Dinkins said that and Marvin Sparks said that. And, you know, so it's just great to see, uh, the you know, you've had. Thank you so much. But very much like Sherry. Sherry, we've been doing this a long time. And through the yeah. course of time, the amount of students that we have, we get a chance to see these students flourish and develop. 
And some students don't take it professionally, but those students that do take it professionally stand on the shoulders of what we were able to give them from what we got from the great people that we had in our life. And we said we just went about, about Buddy Rich off, 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 uh, offline here. You know, th these, these guys inspired us at such a great level. And now that they're gone, it's kind of our responsibility to take this next generation and give them the, the wind beneath their wings for them to move forward. Yeah, that's a, that's a great yeah. way to say it, put it, huh? But Dom, too, I, when I was to teach at NYU, um, I definitely, one of the first people I had come to a class was Dom, right out of the gate, in the uh, early 90s, I think it was, actually. Yeah, I remember that. So Good I go way back with you, too, 30 years, at least. Which is 30 years, Sherry, my gosh, and you <laughs> still look great, you haven't changed. Oh, <laughs> you, just a little different color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there wouldn't be an Academy of Drums without you, Dom. You're, you were integral in getting it all started for me and giving me the courage to go for it and do it. So 22 years later, I mean, we're still here with the Academy of Drums. So, I mean, uh, thank you for that. And yeah. look what has happened to the industry, how we've grown for the industry. Not only has that created more students that's helped the industry grow, we've created more business for the companies. And by having a company like Sabian, who has been incredibly supportive through all of these years, I've been with them well over 30 years. And through all this way, Sabian has been a really intense supporter of education and supporting not only making great product, that's, that, that, that's a given, but then supporting the growth of this industry, what I have seen with them over 30 years. And it really is pretty amazing to see how this, this company has supported us and we're all flourishing with this great, great industry. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So yep. let's, um, let's start out, uh, both Sherry and Neil, we'll start with you, Sherry. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your uh, and and Sherry. I had you on a webinar, so and we want to get to some other things. So, just briefly, um, who are the, the biggest mentors and teachers, and what did they impart to you? Um, because we, I know you've had some very huge um, figures as your teachers and your mentors. So maybe Sherry, you could talk about that first. Okay. Well, the the reason that I play the drums is because of Buddy Rich. I didn't know anything about jazz, and when I was eleven. Uh, one of my teachers said, I'm going to take you to this concert. I was squeaking away on a metal clarinet or sawing away on a cello or something at that point. And uh, <laughs> I saw it and I'm, I'm not lying, you guys, every hair in my body stood on end. Buddy's band was in a tux, Buddy Rich and his Killer Force, 1974, Binghamton, New York at the Forum. And Buddy came out in a black t-shirt and the band started. And I, I can, I might get goosebumps now. I swear to God, it's so long ago. And I was like, I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is, but I have to do that thing especially with a big band. And I raced home and I told my mother and she's like, what? <laughs> she had no idea what I was talking about. But anyway, I'm uh, forging ahead. I, you know, she paid for my drum lessons in the local music store. And I, all I ever wanted to do is study music and went to college. And uh, when I got to New York, um, I went to NYU uh, and I studied with uh, Mel Lewis was my first teacher. Yeah, Mel, and, um, cool. Mel, one of the deepest pockets of swing, like a, uh, you think sometimes drummers would, in, even today, you, people listen to him and say, oh, he's, 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 he's subtle and he's, he's laid back, but he was like a nuclear reactor, like that went right from the middle of the band and just blasted through like the horn section with how, how deep his groove was and how it was just, I, I loved him and never had a stick or a pad at his house. He had this great, huge apartment on the Upper West Side of New York, uh, just, you know, talked a lot. And, um, you know, I sometimes, a uh, couple of times, I played the third set with the Mellowist Jazz Orchestra. Yeah, at the van. yeah, you were saying that, but I was like, <laughs> no, it was, you know, because it was an audience there. You know, it's kind of weird, actually. It was with lucky it was a third set when they did a third set. So, uh, you know, the guys in the band would razz me a little bit. I was a very, very young, early twenties then, and uh, I knew all the charts because I just I loved the band so much, and uh, I never played calf heads before. So I, that was a really good. Um, I got just, it was a butt kicking experience because Mel would be in the audience, play louder, switch <laughs> cymbals. He'd be screaming stuff at me with a crowd of people. And it was, you know, slash awesome and like, what is happening right now? <laughs> so well, what, that was, was what an experience. Right? And you know, we, we mentioned Mel Lewis. You mentioned Mel Lewis. Mel Lewis and Thad Jones, big band, Monday night at the Village Vanguard, Central yeah. Park North. There were, there were tunes and arrangements that these guys did. For you to have that ability of being able to, from your age, and you're still young, to go from that calfskin head old school development to where we are now, that's a pretty good span of, of intense experience. 
But that mm -hmm. that that changed my entire perception of how to play in a big band. And I had done it previous. That was my main focus all through. This was in grad school, through undergrad school and high school. I mean, that's I I play tons and tons of big band. Mm -hmm. but, Nothing like that before. Nothing like that with the horn section that played like that. Oh my God, the drummer's role completely shifts when you're in a band with that extraordinary level of musicianship all around. You know, which anyway, that was mind blowing. And also at NYU, I studied with the great, great, great Adam Nussbaum, who influenced me so much. I love Adam's playing. And man, I just, and still to this day, he's like the greatest teacher. Like he never let me go. Kind of like you do with your students, Dom. I, I love that. And I do that with mine too. Like out of nowhere, it will be like a text message or something from Adam. Check this out. And, you know, I was thinking about it. I think that's, I mean, it is like 30 years ago. And he still, you know, does that. And uh, prior to all that, one of the other major influences, um, before I, in, when I was, um, just before I started undergraduate school, I went out to the uh, Port Townsend Jazz Workshop. Now it's called Centrum Jazz. John Clayton, the great bass player, runs it. Right, and Jeff Hamilton was the drum instructor. Who I sort of knew from the Ray Brown trio a bit. And that was to life, all, absolute life altering for me to study with him and you know he's so funny and just so gifted especially with the brush chops and stuff and he too oh. remains a big huge influence on me and you know and ray, ray brown is a name that you don't even hear that often now as a, as an upright baseball ray was incredible at what he did and when you played with him you couldn't help but just fall into that groove that's beautiful yeah, yeah just yeah yes. just, yeah relentless groove so i i have been really lucky with with teachers of that caliber and then you know then some some other people i've, I've studied with a, a you know not a, a couple of lessons that were really transformative a brazilian drummer in new york who's who's blind named vanderlei perea who was a uh, that was amazing i love brazilian music and it's really great to study with a you know somebody who does it in the brazilian way versus the americanized yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you just in that in that short time you touched on so many things that i i, I could ask you about for an hour but one thing that occurred to me was the, the trust that Mel had in you at that young age, I don't care if it was the third set, to put you in that seat uh, <laughs> at that time. And, you know, my, my son just graduated high school and, and we become, Dom is, is teaching him as, as am I, but we've become quite good friends with Steve Smith. And no. along with Dom, Steve wrote him a nice letter um, on his graduation. And one of the, he said, and I, I don't remember the exact way he said it, but he said, um, you know, it's, I know you're, you're, you want to follow in the life your dad has chosen as a drummer and it's a, it's a life of a cycle of, and he said, intimidation, study, um, discovery and like joy, but he, he used like the intimidation, like, and it's, it's all staggering to me when it's someone that great, like Steve uses it. But I mean, at 20 years old, did you, did you have any sense of like fear or intimidation or were you just like, this is it, I'm in, I'm going like, well, you know, that I, I like that Steve said that because I've heard other great artists that you might um, you know. Just one, one second. Maria Schneider, the great Grammy winning composer. I was on a panel with her about big band with big band leaders. And she stood this is last year at the Jazz Congress at Lincoln Center. And she said, I was crippled with fear and, and still and just that and kind of along with Steve. I don't think there's any artist ever who has not felt that like, oh, my God, can I do this? Um, I no, I was I first I felt confident because I knew all the charts and Mel goes and the charts are back there and of course they none of them were there <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't even dawn on me that playing on calf was just so horrible and you know the drum you know when everything it just it felt awkward even though I knew all the music and I know I was scared out of my mind and yeah. I think when, when you're in the situation you're playing scared you're kind of more 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 reserved and not just being who you are even you know I think I, at least I've had that experience plenty of times where you know. I think so, I'm ready. I feel ready, but and then you yeah. get there, and it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes that fear puts you in the moment better, because mm -hmm. your senses all kind of come to a peak where you have to. There's nothing else going on but the now. So yeah. a little bit of fear, you know, also you know, tied in with a little bit of humility, kind of brings us to a point where that's a good learning place to be at. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to, yeah. you know, I'm not, I don't want to talk about, you know, women, women drummers necessarily, or women in jazz, which is a continuous subject. Um, but one of the things was that when I went, walked up to the stage, I mean, a lot of the guys in the band were kind of not as, yeah. you know, cool as you would have imagined, right. you know, 30 years ago, especially they're like, Oh, Mel, my aunt wants to sit in. Can my sister play? Uh, it's like, you know, instead of, instead, like if I was a, if I was a 20, you know, 21 year old guy, they would have been, yeah, man, 
you know, right, or like right. I, I assume right, right, right. instead they were like automatically, you know, not not making it a welcoming. Not, yeah. not, it wasn't it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't the greatest. Did they ever warm up to you? Did they ever warm up to you? Yeah, yeah, and I've I've you know got to know all all of those guys in the band during that period, and they're they're amazing. Like Dick Oates and Joe Lovano, Joe Lovano, who I studied with for a semester, drums and sax. Oh my God, talk about creative, just explosive ideas from him. That was amazing too at NYU. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and Gary cool. Simoleon, and I mean John Mosca and Earl Gardner. I, I love all of those players. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, before we get to Neil, Dom, um, Dom the, the thing I think the intimidation factor. It's like. Some of it is some of it is you know nerves for the gig, and some of it is just that like our peers are always getting we're all getting better. The game is so high. I'm just impressed with everybody that I come in contact, like all our guests on these shows. But Dom, you did a great interview um, for I think it was for the sessions when you interviewed John Miller, the New York music contractor, right? And 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 Miller, I think, said the op. What did he say to you? Didn't he say like like I I just was too stupid to have any fear. I just said yeah. yes to every gig yeah. and like and that's how he right. Well, that, he? That's what, exactly right. He brought up naivety where where we don't really realize that these plays are that great. We just get in there and do what we do, and and so there's a part of there's a mixture of a lot of different you know uh, ignorances and a lot of different intelligent moments where we can analyze it. So it's the balance of that emotion and that intellect that comes into play. Some people go emotionally fully where they say, I, I have no idea how, what's happening. And other people intellectually say, well, these guys are good players. So it's when we create the barriers for ourselves. If we can just remove that level of EQ and IQ and just go in there and just try and do the best we can at that moment, many times if you just trust your instinct, you will always come out ahead. But I have never been fully prepared for any gig I've ever done. <laughs> Never. That's to this, true. To this day, I get I get called to do a festival. I just did this drummer your festival to go out there, and we go out there. and I'm introducing all these wonderful people, and then they said, "Don, would you do a hi hat piece with just the hi hat to open up the second day?" I said, "Yeah." Next thing I know, I've got almost a thousand people in the audience, and I got a freaking hi hat on the stand, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking Joe Jones and Max Roach, who I learned that from, and I just. I just, I just said, listen, I, I can only do the best I can do at this moment. And I went there yeah. and did it. And of course, it worked out well. But there's a certain level of trust that we have to go into internally and just say, you know, I'm not a bad person and I'm going to do the best I can. Let me just deliver this for whatever this moment can be. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. When, I, when I joined um, Juggling Sons, the, uh, the band members were so good. And I was always nervous, like, oh, my gosh, hopefully I'm playing it right. Hopefully, And it's a much more jam band orientation where it's like more like Grateful Dead. And as I started playing with them, I realized that they make mistakes, too. You know, especially the guitar leader who I was always like looking at. Oh, wow, he's so good. But I would be like, wow, he just made a mistake. And all he would do was just laugh. He would just turn around and laugh at the band and we would just keep rolling with it. And I think that... Um, helps me with my intimidation of just everybody makes mistakes everybody just rolls with it you just have to keep moving forward yeah. so once i got past that now i'll play with anybody it doesn't matter to me <laughs> I, have, I have no fear on playing with anybody i'll sit down with anybody and play with them so i think that's a big part of it is learning that everybody makes mistakes Do you, you take- feel like, oh sorry no i was going to say one of the things that and i uh dom too and joe was well past past 50 when i came to the conclusion and comfort of just saying you know what this is this is who this is how I play and this is me and just being like that's it uh-huh. and without like uh, being terrified of oh my god like Dom am I supposed to be like Joe Jones now am I supposed to sound like so and so or this one or that one or just like you know what uh-huh. I can't this is how I play and um, uh, uh, just a brief quick story Absolutely. that Jeff, Jeff Hamilton told me once as he was in the studio and the producer or whatever kept saying no Jeff it's like a gad thing. It's like a Gad thing. Kept saying over and over, and Jeff said he packed his drums and said, "You better call Steve Gad." <laughs> you know, it's like so. That to me was like one of the most um, just revolutionary developments I've ever had in my life. Is just yeah. to be, you know what? Just screw it, man. I like to swing. This is me. This is what I do, and how I do it. It's my best foot forward. That was a big revelation for me. Yeah, it's a. It's it's a now that I'm past the sixty-five mark. And I'm oh, wow. close to the 67 mark, you get even less concerned about what people think. I have no fear of walking out the front of my house in my underwear to get my mail. That's just the way it is. I got a few <laughs> phone calls about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Actually, so I want to throw it to you, Neil, but I would just say that yeah. it's interesting as the years go on, it's like, you know, all of the people who continue to grow that I admire, it's like looking at yourself and seeing the things that still need work, to be honest, to, that need to grow. But then looking at the things to, to say, you know what, I worked really hard on that and I'm happy with it. I, that's me. I like it, you know, and mm -hmm. to be proud of what you've achieved, but still work on the weaknesses. You know, that's the balance. So, Neil, take us back to your um, your mentors and your key figures. Uh, oh, wow. OK. Um, January 24th, 1982 is my first drum lesson. Wow. So uh, I started then with the local drum teacher, uh, Don McCroskey. He was he owned the local drum shop in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And uh, I studied with him for about, I'm going to say three years. And he was, he was really great because he taught me all the reading. Um, it was reading and rudiments. It was all the fundamentals. And I, I thank him so much now for having given me that to start off. Then I went to the next drum teacher who was also teaching at McCroskey Music was Dennis Barth, which I think took a lesson from Dom once yeah, or a couple yeah. lessons from Dom. Yeah. Dennis has been a mentor of mine and he is still my teacher. He, he will call me up occasionally and say, check this out, like just like Sherry's had. And um, it, it's an awesome relationship with him. It will touch base with each other here or there. And he taught me all the fusion. He introduced me to Dave Weckl. And, David Garibaldi and Vinny Caliuta, all these great drummers. And as a high school kid, I, it just blew my mind, like how good they were. So I, I got totally sucked into that. So then I was like, I want to go to school for music. So I went to Bucks County Community College, which actually had a, it was ranked fourth in the nation at the time for community college music programs. Mm -hmm. And they had um, Jerry Nowak was the, the uh, composer, conductor, arranger for a lot of school music. So you can pretty much go into any school around the country, pull out their sheet music, and Jerry Nowak is probably the one that arranged it. So I studied under him and uh, another gentleman, Cy Platt, who is an amazing trumpet uh, player, mm -hmm. um, teacher. He taught the jazz improv classes, and he was the kind of teacher that when he took a solo on the trumpet, you just kind of like, you were playing, but you just stopped what you were thinking about. And you just watched him play. He was so intense and so selective with his notes. It was just a beautiful thing to observe. So um, I'm actually getting, just like you say, you're getting little goosebumps, you know, you're thinking yeah. about those things, those memories. So um, I did that. From there, um, I just started like, teaching local kids you know here or there from the basement got a job at uh, a local drum shop um and then that's how i met dom uh dom came in and did a clinic so i was like i gotta play the opener so the the uh gentleman who owned the store said yeah you can open for dom so i did like a little drum clinic opener for him and i remember backstage uh dom said uh you're playing great but you got to learn the molar stroke to go to the next level. Uh -huh. And I was like, all right, okay, so teach me. So that was the first lesson, and that was June 27th, 1996. Oh, so there's your first page, Dom. That was the first lesson I had with you. So, oh, And then you changed my life, really. Just to, um, And I, this is a story I tell when I do clinics, too, that uh, my first lesson with Dom, I didn't even touch the drumsticks. We just sat and talked for the whole two hours. I drove three hours up to uh, Long Island Drum Center, took the two-hour lesson, and I told Dom, I said, I want to be able to go into a drum shop, and like people go like, hey, there's Neil Garthley. Ooh, ooh, there he is, there he is. And Dom looked at me, he goes, you're destined to fail. And I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, you're destined to fail. You're doing it for all the wrong reasons. And I'm like, wow. And that three-hour ride home was probably the most thought-provoking ride I've ever took. I just was contemplating my life and my drumming and like what was happening. And I think I came back the next lesson, Dom, and I was like, almost like, I give in. I am yours. Teach me the way. <laughs> <laughs> so then and that you was the journey with Dom. Then I started, yeah, yeah. I started staying with Dom. And um, then the, the place I was at fell apart. The owner just didn't really take care of the business. So I was kind of in control of the teachers at the time. And I just opened up Academy of Drums and Guitar. Actually, it was Academy of Drums first. I just opened up Academy of Drums first uh, in Tom's River. And then started with that. Started building from there. Uh, got to know some of the local 
people in the community, of course. Um, one in particular was a parent of a student who was a TV producer for the local access cable TV shows. And I kind of pitched an idea to him about, uh, it'd be cool to have like a drum show where I teach lessons. And he's like, oh, it'd be great. Let's try it out. So I called it Dramology, and 36 episodes later, I had a whole TV show. Dom was a guest. Joe was a guest. Uh, I had a lot of great uh, people on there. Um, uh, Buddy Schutz, who was the uh, drummer for the Dorsey bands, and uh, mm -hmm. Dom knows them, uh, had him as guests. Uh, it was really, really a great show. So then after that stopped, I just focused more on the school, really trying to get the school organized. I went and purchased a building. Once I purchased the building, I added a guitar, started teaching guitar myself, and then got hooked up with a band, and that was the Juggling Sons. So then that's when we, I did a lot more touring um, around the Northeast, all the way up to the Canadian border, out to Ohio, down to like West Virginia. That whole area was just a touring thing on the weekends, playing festivals, shows, and that really taught me a lot, um, more than anybody could have ever told me in a book or in a lesson, just being on the road, setting up, playing. And it, a lot of times it was fast, so like you had to hustle because the next band's coming up, you only have a short amount of time in the festivals. So it's like a hustling thing and it was so different to me. So it really taught me a lot and that's when I learned the everybody makes mistakes in the band. So it really opened me up as a player that now I just float through things and um, I can sit in with anybody and it doesn't phase me. I can read their body language, I can, sense the music as it's coming up from that jazz improv perspective you can just feel the music changing in which direction it needs to go without ever having it written out on a chart so that really totally developed my play that's great well, that's sherry great. isn't that the truth about touring and traveling about how the insanity of each moment is different right <laughs> yeah i was just uh my i my I was feeling so many emotions when you said on the road i'm like oh. <laughs> <laughs> actually, oh actually, I got a gig. I have a gig right after this. I got a hustle right down the street, and I got a gig tonight, four to eight. Hey. I couldn't believe it. So we're like, yay, we're back in business. Hey, wear your mask. You better have a mask on. Yeah. <laughs> we're outside. Yeah, we're outside. So it's all good. You might want to wear a full hazmat suit then, just to be <laughs> My scuba outfit. <laughs> Before, we we want to actually talk about the current situation. But before I do that, Neil, when you were telling that story about Dom, the first lesson, because my son, you know, had his first lesson with Dom recently and had this, you know, they talked and, you know, cool. Dom really tries to get, understand where the student is before he makes a move. And uh, mm -hmm. when you, I was thinking of that movie that Jack Nicholson is in, where he's like, "You can't handle the truth," you know that that way. Like, <laughs> like, I remember Dom was like, you know, it's like, aren't you gonna play? He's like. You're not ready to see me play yet. You know, like, just give, you, give you a minute, you know. So, um, but that that uh, taking a moment to really see where you were as a, as a player and a person, I think, is why Don's yeah. made such an impression. But um, let's come yeah. back to yeah. the teaching uh, um, experiences. So let's move to uh, right now, um, and uh, I'll go s throw it back to Sherry. Um, so I know you finished a semester at UArts. I assume you were probably teaching online like most of us. And, you know, how have you adapted? You know, obviously you're not touring. Neither am I. None of us are. But uh, what's going on? How have you, how have you adapted and, and what's uh, teaching been like? Well, we did, uh, yeah, lessons on Zoom. Um, and it was, it's, you know, it really is, was challenging for me, especially uh, if the students don't have a, a, a good setup. And I do not have a good setup. It's The drums just sound like... <laughs> <laughs> Most of it, but we adjusted that, and you know that was fine. And we did all of the juries on um, the students actually uploaded all their juries to YouTube, and as the drum faculty, we sort of watched it together uh, long through a, whatever a few hours one day. So that that was that. And then when I'm teaching lessons now, it's always on Zoom, and I just have a real simple one condenser microphone. You know, what I teach is is um, it's it's mostly all jazz oriented, so it's a uh, acoustic and open sound. So it's a you know that's a uh, I'm not a I I'm I'm not saying I'm not kicking and screaming um, about it, but it's not my favorite experience, um, especially where I'm com coming from as a as a jazz person. But I have with my big band, I uh, have we are doing a virtual big band recording. Um, ever after my last gig was March 10th, and my band was going to be at four nights at Dizzy's Club in New York doing another live CD called Diva Swings Broadway, but that was canceled. So I took one of the charts that we had commissioned for that. It's just a kind of a Neil Hefty sort of like bassy vibe on the sound of music. 
Nice. So we did. So we just did a. I just did my part, and we the rhythm section's done. So we're doing one of those virtual, like I guess you do it with the acapella app. So the, some of that oh. stuff, and, and zooming things like this with some of my bandmates and having co like virtual CD release parties and stuff. Uh, you know. So I'm trying to figure it out all out like everybody else is. And so Sherry, you did that. You did the um the quarantine the quarantine uh, recording thing. You did it. You don't you don't run like Pro Tools or Logic or anything. You did it. I did it. I actually, actually, my friend, my friend here in the Poconos has a great recording studio called Red Rock. So I just said, Kent, I want to come in and record my drum track. So he just put on the click and just, I just, you know, he recorded it for me because he gets my favorite uh, acoustic drum sound anyway. Oh, cool. So, so then, the, then the bass player got the track. Then the bass player got the got the track, and we just we're just layering it. And we, you know, we did a video, and someone will put the video montage together. One of my bandmates is really good at that. So yeah. It's, yeah. too, it's, it's too bad about the, the Disney thing. I was talking to Mark Juliana and he said it's a challenge because the clubs, like even the Vanguard, they, there's so many artists that like, they can't just, they can't just say, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll push it back three months till things settle down because they have their book two years out. So, yeah. so yeah. With, with, Disney, with Disney's actually, I was like, I'm not even going to, we always play there in March. It's my band's, my, my birthday. And we've played there since the club opened. So I just said, you know what, we'll take the same week, March, 2020, 21. And they're like, okay, good. Thank you. You know, uh, I just, I'm not even right, going right. to, and who even knows? I didn't mean, you know, with the New York pops, I mean, Carnegie Hall announced just as close till January 6th. So that shoots out three quarters of the New York. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. So I mean, those, those wow. kind of, and we all know Broadway's closed until at least January. And it's like, un, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Anything, cool. anything that's, you know, where you're in a, in a performing arts center or anything bigger than that, it's just too, it's too much, but you know, eventually it'll, it'll come back and, you know, it's good that's to cool. hear Neil, Neil, you're heading out to a gig. What, uh, I yeah. talk about what you've done with the, um, also, uh, while you talk about what you've been doing, can you talk a little bit about have you done anything special in terms of advertising or anything different during the shutdown? With no, no, I haven't actually. Okay. Um, I haven't done any advertising because I just didn't know what was happening. Um, as soon as it hit, uh, I pretty much took the first two days off just to kind of process what was happening in this world. And then I, I was pacing around the house, cleaning everything, touching everything. My wife's like, you need to teach. Go back to work. So I just said, all right. So I set up the thing in the basement, put a drum set there. Um, I figured out that instead of using Zoom, everybody's talking about Zoom and, and Skype. And I have a lot of young students. My youngest student is five years old. So it's really hard for a kid that young to be able to log on with a code and, and make sure that he's going to log on. And maybe if he doesn't, I'm sitting there waiting for him. So I chose to actually call the student direct and I went with Google duo, which is very much like a FaceTime kind of app and it's cross platform. So it works with Android, iPhone, um, computers. Uh, it works with everything. So I just called the student direct and I'll tell you, it's been awesome. I love teaching this way. It's been a complete change for me. Um, the ability to see the student's drum set and go, hey, your, your toms are too far apart. You got to pull those closer together. And, and oh, your snare drum sounds really bad. We got to tune that up. So that kind of thing, it was really nice to see their drum sets and help them get it more proper. And then also I realized the most important thing that a musician probably should have is a music stand. Nobody had a music stand. So wow. I was like, why don't you have a music stand? And like, they're, they're pinning it to the wall. They're putting it on their Tom, you know? So I was like, all right, we, you got to order a music stand. So there's a lot of things like that, that I thought was really great about this is being able to come into their room and see their practice setup, see how they play and, and where they're most comfortable. And the other part too is some of these kids had better drum sets than I had at the shop. Like they had toms and cymbals and I was like, wow, okay, this opens up a greater possibility for us to explore more of your drum set instead of just a little five piece drum set that you have to come into the shop. And they would always say, well, I have a China over here, but um, I guess I'll just hit the crash here. So now I can hear them hit the China. So I, I think it's been awesome. I love it. I like that part of it too, being able to see uh, the setups and, and, you know, it's funny. I I have actually gotten more into Zoom the last couple of weeks because of the audio workarounds. You know, having challenges that, and you go into Zoom and the audio. If you have an interface, it works great with it. But um, one thing I didn't want for I wanted to actually go a little little to the left. Dom, um, we're talking about a little more about our influences and our teachers and legacy. 
And what's been on my mind this week is Al Miller, our teacher, because we're, we're bringing his book back out. So just 30 seconds. Can you talk about Al and Al the book? A drummer who, uh, interesting, Al, who had been my teacher for many, many years back here in Long Island, was in the Marines and he was partnered with Buddy Rich for two years and they taught martial arts together. So that's where Al met Buddy in the Marines. They come out of the Marines, now they're close friends. I didn't know Al knew Buddy that well. I go to Al's house one day and there's Buddy. So Al had this connection to Buddy and this incredible respect from all these people like Louis Belson. So he was a Long Island guy that played with his big band, had his Long Island scene and taught. At one point in the 60s, when he was teaching, he had 80 students himself and he had 13 teachers teaching for him with another 300 students. So he had a school that was, the Al Miller School was incredible. He wrote six books. He put this out. His son, Matthew, uh, you know, he's just a phenomenal man. He's a great, great drummer himself. And now Al passed away 20 years ago in, in uh, January of 2000. And here it is now, we're putting, we're bringing his books back into fruition. And Matt has recorded video and we put together the re-engraving of this book. So it's exciting to see that this great information that was, in the past is now going to be delivered again. I always say, this is absolutely not about the messenger. Whether it's Zoom or Google Hangouts or FaceTime or Skype, I don't care how I have to deliver it. It's about the message. Whether it's Pony Express or DHL or Federal Express, doesn't matter. When you get that document, you're not thinking about how it was delivered. It's what's in that message that's important. So what we're delivering, if this is how we have to do it now, great, let's deliver it. But the point is what Al's message had, 20 years now since his death, we're bringing back his message. I think this is fantastic to finally bring this to fruition. Very exciting. Awesome. And I got a quick little story about Al. Uh, one time I came up to take a lesson with you, Dom, and you're like, hey, come with it. Well, let's go to Al's house. So we go over to Al's house and... And we, he, he invites us in. It was lunchtime, and he made spaghetti with clam sauce. And, and we're eating. We're eating. And I'm like, my eyes are starting to water. I'm like, man, there's something's burning. My eyes, I can feel smoke. And he goes, the garlic bread. And he runs to the oven, and it was burnt black. And he's like, he comes, he comes over to me, and he goes, thanks for, not, thanks for saving my house and not letting it burn down. He's like, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> Yeah. But that was a great experience. And to see his, his school and how he had it all set up. And you're right. There was like, I think Dom even put it this way. It was like the, the, the portal that the amount of drummers that went through that doorway was staggering. And it was, felt cool to be part of that whole school. Yeah, listen, the Rob Morgan scenes, the Tom Brecklines, the Billy Cobham's, the Carmina pieces. There were so many great players that went through that. And he, back in 1960, he had two full double bass drum hits up in the studio mirrors all around a practice pad kit play along tunes this guy had was way ahead of the curve in the 60s yeah so listen nothing is new it really isn't sherry one one um challenge right now is that and uh you got and actually you guys are all free to address this of course but um you know that a lot of the students can't play together their programs have been suspended so obviously you know is there anything there's really, is there any special thing you're doing? You know, you're using play alongs or what are you, what are you, are you doing anything to address that fact at all or can it be addressed? Uh, no, well, I, I don't know if there's anything that comparable at all to creating music together at, at all. So uh, even though I like Dom's attitude that helped me actually to deliver the message. It doesn't matter how it comes, but I actually like, I mean, all the on the drumless play along tracks, I, I do really like the turn it up, lay it down. All those tracks, those I think those are great. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are fun, uh, and and there's there's a lot. There's um, Gordon Goodwin and Bob Florence and some other big bands have drumless tracks too. You can buy the recording and play along with the big bands. Yeah. So so some of that stuff. But again, even um, the U Arts juries, some of the students were playing to play along tracks, and it takes in a jazz setting especially it takes all the spontaneity and creativity out of it because you're it's the, the track is the exact same thing I and mean, you can do different things each time you play through it but it's like you're not responsive to anything really <laughs> so it's in that way yeah. it's a it can that can be really challenging yeah um, you, so you, this you know this book this is the turn it up and lay it down jazz tracks 
And I think, you know, it's funny because j- just a little aside, they, after you've been teaching these for a while, you realize, I don't think they recorded any of them to a click. I think they had a drummer that they just took out. Yeah. So, so you have the additional thing of like, you have to listen to it's, it teaches the student to listen to that bass and the guitar because they're not staying metronomically in time, yeah. but, but it, it does it in such a way that like, it's not anything like a human where you'd be reacting to each other because they can't hear you. Right. So it's like, it's a strange uh, thing that happens, but it's still useful. I think. Mm. You know, I did really like, um, I like what uh, Tommy Igo did for a hundred days. I don't know if any other drummers are doing this, but every single day I go challenge hey, every day. Like if he just had thousands of people joining him, I thought that was super cool. Like anybody, I don't know if other drummers are doing that, but I was thinking like, huh, I wonder if I could do something. I don't know, just every day at 10 o'clock, here we go. And just, we'd just be on there. I thought that was great and interactive for everybody. So Sherry, I, I, just want, I want to show this uh, comment that just came in for you okay. from Jason Apostoleris. Just want to say hello from New London. Oh. He says, Dom, always a legend there. Sherry has always been an inspiration and encouraging drum friend. She ran a weekly jam at the Village Gate a million years ago, and I always enjoy listening to her, and she was very encouraging and made me feel welcome. Thank oh, you. Thanks, Jason. Wow. I, thanks for, that was that was one of the cool. best times of my life. Eight years I ran a session there, every wow. Saturday from 2 nice. to 6, nice. until, it clo- until it closed. Talk about education. Yeah. That was something else. That was great. But yeah, so anyway, Very there's cool. an on- online stuff that's happening and uh, and drummers are offering. And I think it's so great how our community of, you know, family of just, just we want to just give things to just keep connected. And I think that's so amazing, you know. Yeah. It really is, especially with drummers. Let's face it, drummers. There's a there's a, a camaraderie and a, and and a closeness that we have in this community that is so unique to any other instrument. It really is. We are blessed that we have had this passion and that this instrument shows us, and that we're able to communicate this and sharpen each other. I always say we need steel that steel sharpens steel. We use steel to sharpen steel, but it is man that sharpens man, and that's exactly what drummers do. We sharpen each other. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's funny yeah. too. You, you mentioned um, about Adam, and there was a comment earlier. I, I can't remember, scrolled up, but um, someone said, I'd love to take a lesson from Adam about brushes. This is the ideal time. A lot of our members have taken lessons with Dave Weckl, uh, David Garibaldi. A lot of, a lot of our uh, people who might not know, may normally not have the time uh, even sherry's always traveling you know if you want to get a lesson with someone you've always dreamed of having a lesson with i think now is the ideal time to do that yes yes you know? for sure yeah and, and every, yeah. every every time you do that you get ideas every time i take a lesson i the ideas go right back into my teaching practice you know it's like i want to just share mm-hmm. all that stuff you know That's so I, the I, of stealing <laughs> <laughs> Right. One other one other small thing I did for my own sanity is I, I don't know, I decided it would be, I enjoyed people doing little mini lessons. So when this started, I started doing like a minute or less, like a mini drum lesson for my YouTube page. Right. It would be, people really liked it, but then they, you know, then they would keep asking me a million more questions about them, <laughs> which is good right. though. I mean, I just wanted to like put some fun stuff out there that I, I teach all the time. So that, that kept me really sane actually doing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And so both for both of you guys and, um, I guess Sherry, you can you can answer first. As far as the number of students you're teaching right now, has it stayed steady pretty much, or? No, no, it's all, it's all over the place. And sometimes, um, if it's not through the context of a school, I have a uh, through a school, I have a lot of adult students that might, you know, I, I w- they want to learn a specific thing, you know, largely to do with jazz sometimes with technique. So it'll be like I'll give somebody eight lessons, then I don't see them for a while. So you know, it alternates in a, like five to sometimes. 10, sometimes one, but it's, it's not steady at all. No, mm. I don't have like a, a set studio. Mm. What about you, Neil? Has it been steady since the shutdown? It, it, yeah, actually it has. I just converted all my students right over. Um, there was about four or five of them that didn't want to do it. Uh, but after like two months of it, they some of them came around. So I got some new students back, even picked up a couple new students that just contacted me. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been going strong. Right now I'm holding at 45 students every week, um, just cruising along. And, you know, and, and when I was been thinking about this, and I knew I was coming on this, uh, I, I was thinking about all the years of teaching, the 22 years of the Academy of Drums. So I averaged about 60 students a week. That's 70,000 half hour lessons. 
35,000 hours of teaching, which is wow. four years straight of my life. I couldn't believe it. When I saw the numbers, I was just like, oh my gosh. So I am very blessed to be able to have these students just roll right in, keep going through it. Um, and all ages, like I said, five up to adults, seniors. And it's, uh, it's, it's really awesome that they're very receptive to it. And something else I did want to bring up um, that I do use is Google Classroom. And if okay. other drummers aren't using this, it's very effective. The kids use it with school. Mm. It's a great way to set up a classroom just between you and the student. And there's a stream where it's like a text thread. You can write down like a journal, what you've been working on, keep track of what the lessons are. And then there's a classwork section where you can post PDFs, song links, video links. And if you want a student to check something out, like, hey, check out Dom's video, I can post it right into their classroom and they can watch it right then and there on whatever device they're on. Um, if there's a PDF or like if I write something out for a student, I can easily scan it, send it to them within the lesson time and they have it right there. They'll pull it up and we can start working on it right then and there inside the lesson. So for other drum teachers out there, Google Classroom is really effective and it's free. That's is it really cool a, so just for two people or can more go in? You can set it up for as many people as you want. You just give them the code to the classroom. Um, okay. I just have it as a one-on-one -on -one with each student. So it's it's specific for them. They can always go there and get their information. If, if let's say they lose a page or something, they can always go back to the classroom and print off the, the PDF right. again. Mm -hmm. So it's very effective, but you can have more people in it. Like my son with his school, he had all his whole class is in that classroom. So they would log in and do all their schoolwork. Are you able to record the session? That you can't do. It's not really like a recording video thing. It's more of like a portal where you can share things back and forth. Mm -hmm. I can even do assignments. Like if I said, hey, for next week, you need to do a drum solo. I can assign them and they have to kind of report in with the assignment. You can even assign watching videos. It's, it's really effective. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty surprised at how well it works. Hey, by the way, um, I just, I'm sorry, Neil, you because know, this uh, thought just popped into my head. Um, and tell me if, Dom, if you knew this, I, I don't know why I didn't know this workaround. So I was teaching on Zoom a lot more, as I mentioned the last couple of days, and um, I just stumbled into this and, I, and it, I don't, it hasn't come up in any of our sessions. So in Zoom, like in StreamYard, you can share screen. I can share a screen and you can hear the YouTube audio, right? So in Zoom, you can share screen and it shares the audio of whatever website you're on. Or, or if, you, if you share screen, it shares your audio with the person on the other end. Yeah. So I'm like, That's awesome. all this, all this time, I haven't figured out that if the student, if the student has an MP3 on their computer, play along solved. Absolutely. So, yeah. so you can so, just have. So Joe, is it, so they're playing it on their side and they're, you're just listening yeah, to like, it? Like normally we have, we've talked about all these workarounds where you have to use an interface and two channels. But if you, if you share, mm -hmm. if you share screen on zoom, it shares the audio, but it still keeps the, the, in, the audio coming in from the person on the other end. Okay. So, so you can. Now, are they still hearing it delayed? No, they're they're. What I'm saying is like, if the student has like, let's say they have a play along track from Baby Steps. If they have it on okay. their computer and they share screen to me oh, oh, and oh, they right. play, to you. Okay, now gotcha. they can gotcha. play a track. That was the whole thing. Like I have these young students that can't yeah. play track, so that's like the solution. You know, it's like. Right. 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 You, you know. so what I've been doing is um, I, I went out and bought one of these little headphones with a microphone that does a pretty good job at compressing when they hear loud volume. So I just pump the song from my side and just have the student play along. Now, yeah. I do hear them in a delay, Yeah. but I've actually gotten really good at knowing if they're in time or not. So they're always consistently like a half second behind. Right. So it sounds like a really bad echo, but I've learned how to tell if they are consistent by just either watching their hands or listening to their echo kind of effect. Yeah. And then to them, they're, they're playing along with the song. The, and if, the only if I play along, then they hear me normal. Right. The only, the only trouble with that is I've experienced is the delay isn't, the delay isn't uniform. Mm. So if you, you know, but it, we're, we're just coming up with these solutions on the fly. I love it. There's a great question that I want us all to um, address. So Joe, can I ask you one thing? Has anybody used Jam Kazam, that app for playing live? Mm -hmm. It's been coming up. A few a few SEN members yeah. have tried it with mixed results. But my brother yeah. likes it. He says it works. <laughs> you can play together. I'm sure they're – I think – I understand Yamaha is trying to develop a technology to make play, playing together possible. So, I'm telling you. So, wow, that'd be cool. There's, they're sitting yeah, on a gold awesome. mine if they do. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, 
let's put this question up here. But Neil, you know, you made me think at some point, you know, I know Sherry and Dom, you've, you've gotten way more awards and recognition that, than I have, but they made me like a permanent member of the drum set committee um, at PAS something. And I, I remember think I remember thinking uh, like an honorary prayer. I was like, this is total proof of what I said for years. If I keep this up long enough, soon and pretty soon people are going to think I know what I'm talking about, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have fooled people for years. I hear you. <laughs> uh, Chris hey, Lesko, Chris. And we'll have to have Chris on as a guest of yours, I think, Dom. We should get him on here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris, this is yeah. a great, an interesting question. So let's go around the horn, starting with uh, Sherry. Uh, what are some ways you may have grown during this time that you otherwise wouldn't have? Well, uh, when all the work canceled and all my duties as a big band leader kind of halted, I was I uh, got back into practicing quite a bit, I uh, more than ever, and I was really excited. I mean, I sat at my drums for five hours that went by like five minutes, and I'm not kidding. Like when I was in college, and I was like elated at the freedom from not working. <laughs> that wow. sounds insane, you know. And I. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, then uh, truthfully, then I, I then I went like straight down the depression tube for a minute. Then I pulled myself back out. You know, it's like doing all this practicing is one of the things that I, I was like, I feel like I'm in college again, you know, especially practicing a lot of brushes. I was telling um, uh, you guys earlier, I, I did break my left foot. So I, I, that really took my hi hat out of my uh, in March mm. for six weeks. So that was wow. a drag. And I was like, thank God all my work is canceled. I couldn't do it anyway. <laughs> no, right. I'm kidding, I'm yeah. kidding. But it was a strange, strange time to have all that happen. So that, you know, got me really into a, a lot of brush practicing. And I, I, I loved it. I mean, that was really transformative mm. nice. in that way. Were you, were you doing it uh, on the real drums or on the ironing board like Steve and I uh, was doing in his hotel room? <laughs> <laughs> on my, on my on different, different snare drums and uh, yeah, I was on the drum. But I, it's always funny because when you can't put weight, I mean, I couldn't even put my foot down on the ground. So my left foot was all like um, jacked up, hanging over a barrel, actually. And it put my body in a very mm. awkward position. But it was, uh, I, I don't know, I, I had that. I'm sure we all remember that carefree time when all we cared about was our instrument. And there was, you know. Yeah. rent and mortgages and all that wasn't even really in our minds and i felt like that for yeah. you know a while that yeah. made me really inspired is there is there a certain aspect of your playing that you more than on others that you've enjoyed working on or just an overall like what i enjoy practicing approach um uh, br brushes i love play practicing brush technique and studying right. all different angles when i you know there's just so many ways to do it it's uh it's what's more uh it's got more flexibility even than, than stick playing just because there's just so many options and so many things you can do yeah. with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that, that was really cool. And I, and we've really been working on um, all sorts of different um, bass drum technique too, different ways of playing the bass drum and fitting it into a jazz context. It's one of those things like where I would tell my students, Hey, you have to sit there and be so dedicated to learn this thing that, you know, it's not, a, it's not doing something for a couple yeah. of measures and going, yeah, man, nailed it. You got to do it for a half an hour without stopping the same yeah. thing, you know. So I mean, I that I do that. I, that's the way I practice. So I'm working on a technique thing. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm just, you know, in that. Just I, like I'm running a marathon and just keep doing it and doing it until it feels right. right. So that's yeah. and I, I when I when you're working and touring and stuff all the time, you don't really have that luxury or even a emotional brain space to even practice like that. At least I, I don't, <laughs> and now I do. Mm -hmm. That's great. There's a nice comment for you. Sherry's the ah. brush queen. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Neil, Neil, what about you? How have you grown in this in this time? Uh, I've, I've learned that this is possible. I always felt I was the one-on-one -on -one kind of local drum teacher, you know, uh, that I, I did my best lessons on that one-on-one. -on -one, but as soon as this happened, I couldn't do that. So now it really opened my eyes that this is completely possible and around the world too. So um, for instance, I had just posted on Facebook, you know, Hey, I'm doing these online lessons. And one of my former students who was an exchange student from 20 years ago, who lives in the Czech area, he called me up on Facebook and we did a lesson on Facebook messenger. So I was like, wow, this is so cool. It totally opened me up to a whole nother level of the world instead of the Tom's river, just only my local, area but uh, as far as playing um i've just been teaching really I, almost every day i'm teaching so i'm always on the instrument um if it's a different idea a student brings up and then i'm always the kind of teacher that that was cool but now let's do this this and this to it let's change it here let's do this let's modify it and i'll write up a whole worksheet for that and it might be sometimes very challenging and then i'll start teaching that to the other students so one idea from one student now becomes lessons for all and it helps me develop 
in areas I would have never thought of it, like that what that kid developed I would have never thought of it that way it's, it was unique to his thought process mm -hmm. so now I can kind of adapt it and we'll learn from the students to so to speak uh, I've been doing that and then guitar um, just teaching guitar trying to get better at guitar it's a great way to have dual students so you're not just drums you're able to supplement my student base by having guitar lessons too so it's uh, really great I love it Great. I just want to, before I throw it to Dom, um, hey guys, we I am seeing the comments from YouTube for sure. Mike, thanks for this comment. Um, I'm seeing the comments from YouTube and Facebook. There's so many great comments. We love all you guys and girls. You're all typing in all this great stuff. I wish I could get to all of them. I just can't. But yes, I'm definitely seeing your comments. If you're watching on YouTube, please make sure you come back. And yes, Mike, we've talked about this a lot with different cam camera angles. Um, you know, for instance, me here, I have a couple of Zoom cameras set up. Um, you know, you can very easily switch between them. You can go, you guys see a different angle now? Yep. And if you want so to get, what, your, get, what your kind of cam, get your foot cam going, so you can, you can totally do it. So I'm, I'm running a very simple, I have a, a zoom, uh, I have the zoom, a Q2N right on a little mount right here, which I can't push this back. Okay, couldn't see it. Let me, hang on, let me back this up. Uh, I can't, there's a, there's a, oh, it's there's, okay. a, there's a wire stopping. Let me see if I can. It's on a little mount right here. Uh, okay. A little camera mount. And then I have another one on a little tripod down there and it's really simple. I, if you want to go, hey, really crazy, um, Jim Toscano's your man. He'll advise you how to do it. I want it to just switch easily so I can show my foot to a student. So. These things, they just show up in the settings for every single program. Well, at least I know for Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, StreamYard, BeLive, and anything that I've tried, they show up just in the settings. Nice. And it all works the same way. So yes, you can do that. And everybody watching on YouTube, yes, please, don't don't think, I'm, I'm not ignoring anybody on purpose. I'm just uh, not fast enough and we have a lot, a lot to cover. So Dom, let's hit you last and tell us how you've grown and what you've been, how you've improved during this pandemic. Well, interesting. Going back to Chris Lesson's question, you know, there has to be, which I always have, is what I call the hunger for change. It's got to be this burning desire that you want to grow and change. And I think you have to face each challenge as an obstacle. As I mentioned, I removed the word problem from my vocabulary and replaced it with the word challenge. But inside the word challenge, the first three letters and the last three letters of the word challenge is the word change. So we have to embrace change so I have embraced all of this. What this probably has done, and although I've been a very disciplined person in my life, I probably have become even more disciplined. More disciplined, that's self-control. So I had to focus on every little aspect of who I am and how I can better explain that message. I have over 3,000 students that are on a list. It's intense. I teach from Tuesday through Saturday from 8 in the morning until 6 at night. Tonight I'm going till nine because I've got a couple of students in Japan and they're 13 hours ahead of us. So to me, the intensity is I want to reach them all. It's absolutely not about the money. Many of these students, if they can't afford it, I will teach them for nothing. It's about the momentum that we can create in who we are to see the person that you are today. Can that person be enhanced and better tomorrow? And what can happen in the next six months? What this pandemic does, it's kicked us all in our ass to grow and be more hungry for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's a great way for us to uh, to wind down our session today. Dom, you always put it in great perspective. And, and I'm just honored. You know, you're such a great interviewer. For those of you who haven't been watching, every Thursday at 2, Dom features one of our SEN members uh, in a discussion. Uh, many of them are people who have been lucky enough to study with him, but not all of them. Um, and it's just amazing to uh, see how you are such a great interviewer. And I really admire that. And to have you as my Ed McMahon here, uh, 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 to my to my Johnny Carson, <laughs> I know. know. It's, it's been a, a great honor, but, uh, anyway, this is this has been a great this has been a really great time for me. Sherry, thank you for being here. Neil, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, and thanks to Sabian. They have done fantastic again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank Excellent. You. Thank you, Sabian. We, thank you. Very we, good. We'll definitely get into. Dom has been really good on these sessions about talking about symbols and and um. 
you know, I'm, we'll have to get back into the models. We like, there's just so many of them, but Sabian's always here for us. Sabian Education Network will continue to uh, host these. So Don will be back next week with his regular show. I'll be back next week with, with Don with this show. Uh, but also before that on Tuesday at one, I have the great Will Calhoun as my guest for an interview. Cool. All right. Um, awesome. I'm really, really excited um, to talk hey. to Will. I get to, uh, I get to fanboy Will and ask him everything I ever wanted to ask him. So, <laughs> anyway, everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us, all you, you members. Too. You guys are the best. Thanks for being part of SEN, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.